In our last episode, the pet detective team helped old Homer save his gold mine. Little Thomas and Ruger won the two-man kayak race on the Russian River in Northern California. Now they all return back to the feed store slash office and Polly Opossum had a new customer with a mystery that needed to be solved. The call was from a lobster fisherman in Maine. He said his family had been lobster fishing for the last seven generations when all of a sudden they couldn't catch lobsters anymore. Pepe said, Lobsters? I love seafood! And he led the team straight to the airport. The fishing community of Fishstick, Maine had already brought the team their tickets. No time to waste. But the airport security did make Pepe remove his fisherman outfit. Pepe tends to get a little over anxious when it comes to food. They jetted non-stop across the country to the northeast coast of Fishstick, Maine. Now the town was originally named Bisquick, but when the town folks said it with their main accent, it sounded like they were saying fish stick, so they just changed the name. Now they were picked up at the fish stick airport by Michael Gizzard McKenna, and he took them to his boat that was just docked a few blocks away. There by Gizzard's boat on the docks, he explained the problem of not catching any lobsters. He and his fellow fishermen have tried all kinds of tricks that the McKenna family have learned and invented over seven generations of lobster fishing. The lobsters they have learned love traveling and clearance sales of all kinds. So Gizzard would disguise his lobster traps as little stores that were having sales of all kinds. Gizzard painted signs for vacations in Cancun, Mexico with free sunscreen so they wouldn't burn like lobsters. Now lobsters being very suspicious by nature, but loved the bargain even more, would line up to get into his lobster traps. However, lobsters never forget, and they never fail for the same sale trick twice. This kept Gizzard constantly making more and more sale signs. 50% off lobster shoes, even though the lobsters don't wear shoes. And free piano lessons from the famous Maestro McKenna, on lobster friendly pianos of course. This all soon got Gizzard into a lawsuit for false advertising from the local lobster union 377, who brought a class action lawsuit against Gizzard and the fish stick fishing community with Gizzard as the main instigator for false advertising on lobster traps. And this is famously known as the bait and switch trials. The lobsters in the end were victorious and this put an end to the any lobster fishing. Once you upset a lobster by cheating them on false advertising, the lobsters are slow to forgive and forget. So the pet detective team went out fishing with Gizzard to watch a real pro fish as he attempted to catch other types of seafood to sell to the local market. But after a long day of fishing with Gizzard, they realized that local fishermen were great lobster fishermen, but they were terrible at any other kind of fishing. Maybe they need the lobster fish out farther in the deeper waters where the lobsters don't know the fishermen but the lobsters are a close-knit group and communicate very well with a form of Morse code by clacking their claws together. Each group had a lobster that would send and receive the messages. They were known as clackers. Samuel and Isaac just happened to be amateur clackers. And Samuel and Isaac would listen in and they were soon to realize lobsters are excellent at communicating and were still upset with the lobster fishermen in the bait and switch fiasco. Oh, oh, now where's little Thomas and Ruger? Well, after they won the two-man kayak race that was put on by Boris Ivan Coffalot, they were approached by a couple fellow kayakers from Australia. They are owners of a boomerang company, and they are in America to introduce their boomerangs, but they only brought left-handed boomerangs. Now Jack and his kangaroo partner Ollie, who is left-handed but hurt his arm during the kayak race, asked Thomas if he would be interested in helping. 
Thomas said, I've never seen a boomerang, let alone use one. No worries, mate. We'll teach you. Thomas agreed. They told Thomas how to throw it and it would go in a big circle and it would return to him when it was done correctly and soon he'll learn to catch it himself. They said they will let Thomas practice while they go eat lunch. Right about then, Ruger returned from loading up their kayak and equipment from the race. Thomas explained to Ruger about Jack and Ollie and how the boomerang works. Jack and Ollie will pay them when they get good at it. All Ruger heard was blah, 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 and all he could see was a big yellow stick. Thomas cocked his arm back and threw the boomerang as hard as he could. Then Ruger, after he promised he would just sit and watch, took off like a bolt of lightning right after his big yellow stick. Just as the boomerang started to slow down to turn to come back to Thomas, Ruger leaped in the air and caught it in his mouth. As he would proudly return back to Thomas, Thomas would have to again explain to Ruger. Ruger would shake his head agreeing, but as soon as Thomas would throw it, Ruger couldn't contain himself and he would bolt off again. Each time he proudly returned with the boomerang in his mouth and they would try again, but Ruger couldn't help himself. After about an hour of trying, Jack and Ollie returned from lunch, with Thomas and Ruger no further along than when they had started. All Jack and Ollie could do was laugh. They said they'd never thought about it being used as a dog toy. They work at a dog rescue orphanage back home, and they never have enough time to exercise all the dogs every day. So Jack and Ollie sent Thomas and Ruger to a local dog shelter with a wagon full of boomerangs of all sizes. Thomas and Ruger used the little ones for the small dogs and the large ones for the big dogs. Thomas would throw the big ones far and the little ones shorter so all the dogs got in on the play. Well, Thomas and Ruger never got the spots from TV commercials they were planned on. They did get something much better. New friends and happy dogs. Meanwhile, Back in Fishstick, Maine, the team were still trying to brainstorm ideas on how to help the lobster fishermen start catching lobsters again, or at least something out of the ocean. Pepe had one of his Pepe ideas. Pepe thought it would be a great idea if they dressed up like cowboys and ride seahorses, and his would be named Sea Biscuit, and they would have a lobster roundup. Now Pepe does have some wild ideas, but sometimes he is right, just not this time, and the team politely declined the idea. They didn't have any luck trying to fish, so they had to come up with something else. That's when Bailey and Colonel noticed an old bi-wing plane that had been left behind at Fishstick Airport after the annual air show just last month. That's when the pet detectives decided to fly out to deeper waters in the oceans to investigate on other options the fishermen might have. With Charlie as a pilot, little Colonel as a navigator who had already had a map drawn up and a plan, the boys, Samuel and Isaac, to be lookouts. Look out for what, Pepe asked. He was still a little miffed over his seahorse lobster roundup idea being turned down. Bailey said, we don't know, but it'll give us more information on the local fishing waters. Pepe says, I don't need information for my brain to work. The team said, we couldn't agree with you more. Regardless of Pepe's thoughts, Charlie and Colonel and the boys, Samuel and Isaac, prepared to take off after Charlie did his pre-flight checks and loaded up and headed out on their fish fact-finding mission. This is not your average two-wing biplane. It is used as an acrobatic plane by wing walkers and they had safety harnesses that were left in the plane. So Sammy and Isaac put on the harnesses. Charlie headed down the runway and lifted off and made a smooth right hand turn heading out over the clear blue ocean water and to the starting place that little Colonel the Navigator had marked out on his map. As Charlie flew along he could feel the plane's controls not responding as well as they should be. 
The boy said we have the wing walker harnesses on and would walk out on the plane wings to see if it helped the plane. Charlie said okay and the boys crawled out on the left and right side of the bottom wing at the same time to keep the plane in balance. Now the boys did work on a trapeze act in a circus and were very much at home out there on the end of the wings. This did help the control of the plane for Charlie and he could easily control it now. And the boys had a much better seat to view the wide open spaces of the ocean. Well the day was bright and clear as was the water. After an hour of flying back and forth on Colonel's instructions so they wouldn't keep flying over the same spots. The boys, Samuel and Isaac, spotted a disturbance in the water below. The water was all foamed up, so Charlie flew low and slow over the spot, and they couldn't believe what they were seeing. There was a huge school of fish sticks. Now some people just go and buy their fish sticks, but they are much better when they are raised and caught in the wild. And the more they flew, the more schools of fish sticks they came across. All the while, little Colonel dutifully marked each location on his map, and they headed back to the airport, and the team shared their findings with Gizzard and the local fishermen. Gizzard said they have tried catching fish sticks, but the holes in their nets are square, and the fish sticks just swim right through them. Now how can they catch wild fish sticks? As the discussions went on, the boys who loved playing marbles were playing marbles, and Charlie noticed the bag the boys carried their marbles in had round holes and was made out of a net. Eureka! Bailey would call the marble company and by the next morning Gizzard had his fish net with round holes. Gizzard was off with the team on his fishing boat with Colonel giving precise directions to the fish stick sightings. As they got close Gizzard lowered the marble nets. The nets quickly filled with the square fish sticks as they were caught in the round holes of the marble nets. Soon all the local fishermen bought marble nets and fish stick Maine became known for its tasty wild fish sticks. The bonus side to all the fishing of the fish sticks is that lobsters have huge egos and did not want the fish sticks getting all the attentions. And the lobsters let bygones be bygones, and soon the fishermen had a good balance of both lobsters and wild fish sticks to supply to the markets. This time, no false advertisement used in the catching of the lobsters. Once again, the problem solved by the pet detectives as they said their goodbyes and headed off to the airport for a long flight home. But as we have all learned, wherever the pet detectives go, adventure is sure to follow. Now Charlie has mastered the very rarely used like and subscribe kick and chop move only mastered by a few courageous subscribers. So take Charlie's challenge on hit the like and subscribe buttons and be sure to share this episode with a friend and to round all the bases and head home, ring that notification bell and leave a kind comment because we here at the Pet Detectives are feeling a little sensitive today. Remember, stay tuned and we'll see you next time on the adventures of the Pet Detectives.